the book of Nehemiah chapter 4, follow along at verse number 1. The Bible says, But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they built, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their wall. And as we continue in chapter number 4 and in our study in the book of Nehemiah concerning building and battling, I would like to preach to you on this thought tonight, rebuilding the rubble out of the rubbish. Rebuilding the rubble out of the rubbish. And no, I'm not talking in ubby dubby language if those of you who have ever heard about that. But tonight we are rebuilding the rubble out of the rubbish from chapter number 4. And we're going to look deep within this chapter to understand just a few thoughts about it. Before we get there though, I just want to recap over what we have attacked in the Word of God in these few chapters. Number 1, we looked at this from chapter 1. What is your response? What will your response be when you hear about such things that go on in your life? And we see that Nehemiah had a burden for his people. Nehemiah had a burden for his place. Nehemiah had a burden to pray. He was burdened for his position before God. He was burdened for God's promises to be fulfilled. He was burdened for God's prosperity in his homeland. And then he had a burden to make a difference. When we got to chapter number 2, we looked at a vision to arise and build. And we saw that it was a vision that he could not shake. It was a vision that he stood for. It was a vision that God supplied for. It was a vision that was not supported by all, but it was a vision that was supported by God, and that was what was important. And then it was a vision that was steadfast in the mind of Nehemiah. And then last week, God so wonderfully put together a message through Brother David Duff from Fairbanks, Alaska, that went right in with what we were dealing with in the book of Nehemiah. And my friends, can I see it say this about that? God never ceases to amaze me. When Brother Dave Duffett was sitting in my study over at the house, he began talking about things. And then he said, you know what? I think the Lord's leading me to preach a message. I recently preached from Fairbanks from the book of Nehemiah. And I just kind of smiled and said, I, I, I think that'd probably be good. And a little while later, the Lord said, well, maybe you should be the one that kind of confirms that. And so later at dinner, I told them and said, listen, I said, you know what? We've been dealing with the book of Nehemiah on Wednesday nights. I believe it would be a good thing to hear from you from the book of Nehemiah. And so he brought exactly the next chapter to us that we were going to deal with if I was going to preach. And he brought to us from Nehemiah chapter number 3 the understanding that everybody should be doing something. As all those different families and different tribes were involved in building the work and building the wall, they started at the north end and they wrapped around the, to the east, down to the south, and up again to the west, and they were building the wall of God. And a few things that I remind us of that he dealt with was this. Simply put, from the very first verse of chapter 3, the priests were the ones mentioned first about being involved in the work of rebuilding the wall. The men of God were setting the example for the rest of the people. And then we noted that some of these people were involved in a work that they have never done before. It was not their normal thing to do, but they got involved in building the wall. And then we saw the Tekoites. If you look at verse number 5 of chapter number 3, we're reminded of them. And next unto them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. And he so wonderfully brought out that at all times, not everyone may be doing something for the cause of God. And I believe the reason why it says put their necks to the work of the Lord was going to be because it was going to be hard work. I mean, how many of you have ever faced neck pain from work? I mean, from sitting in an office desk, to lifting buckets of gravel, to smoothing out concrete. It doesn't matter what you may do. If it's work, your neck may actually take some physical load from it and you'll be rubbing your neck and boy, it's been a tough day at the workplace. These nobles would say, that's not me. Feed me the grapes. That's not me. I'm not cut from that cloth. I'll do something else. But we see that as a whole, for the most part, everybody got involved in the work of God. God, as Nehemiah had a burden and a vision to carry out. And then one last thing that we noticed from his message last week in verse 27, after them, 
the Tekoites repaired another piece over against the great tower that lieth out. And he brought up the thought that maybe they were helping in the area that the nobles were supposed to take care of. And we're reminded that no matter how large the church is, how small the church is, it could possibly be that those who serve the most will continue doing the most and filling the void where there is a void. Now that brings us to chapter number 4 in dealing with something that really ticks the enemy off. I don't know about you, my friends, but we all have an enemy, and his name is the devil. We have the flesh about us, and we have the world that's against us. And something that ticks the enemy of our life off, and the enemy of God off, is when the people have a mind to work. We're going to notice this, number one, as we rebuild the rubble out of rubbish. Number one, the enemy talked smack. The enemy talked smack. Look at it. Look at it. Verse number one. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth. He took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren, the army of Samaria, and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which which they build this, and if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. The enemy's talking smack, and my friend, can I tell you something? The enemy is still going to do that in 2014. The enemy does not like what we are doing for the cause of Christ. Whether it be the devil, the philosophies of this world, or whether it be our own flesh, we have these three that war against us, and they're going to try to convince us that serving God, having a mind to work, and doing the will of God is not what we should be about doing. The flesh is going to want to say, you should be like the nobles. People should feed you. People should serve you. You don't need to do all of that. Let so and so do it. The flesh is going to speak against the work and the word and the will of God and so will the devil. So will the world's philosophy and we just need to understand and lay it out there that the enemy is just going to talk smack. How are we going to respond when the the enemy does. Now I want to say this secondly, the builders asked for payback. So the enemy is going to stop talks back, but the builders asked for payback. Look with me. It says in verse number 4, here's a prayer they prayed. They said, Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Oh, man. I mean, earlier they were praying for their sinful condition before God. But now they are praying because the enemy is right on top of them. We're going to see in just a second what we are dealing with. We are going to see that this enemy is going to rise up and try to pick apart these Jewish people so they cannot be effective in their building. The Israeli people seeing this, they cry out to God like we would cry out, Lord, bar and bind the enemy. Hold them back. Please do not allow them to impact or affect our work if they can continue on, then we're not going to be able to build the wall like we desire to build the wall. And they're praying that God would bring payback to the enemy that captured them. Listen, you have an enemy that's ruthless. You have an enemy that will stop at nothing to trip you up. But I want you to notice that these people were not taking revenge into their own hands. They are praying that God would avenge them in this situation. So notice the difference. We are not as Asking you to fight physically the enemy. We are asking you to stand for your God and keep faithful in the work and let God handle the enemy. You know what? God does just that in the scriptures. You see here that the enemy was about to stand against Israel and war against them, but God did not allow that to happen. If you look with me at verse number five, or excuse me, verse number six, we see our third point. So number one, the enemy will talk smack. 
The builders asked God for payback. And then number three, when it came or concerning work, there was no lack. Concerning work, there was no lack. Look at verse six. So built we the wall and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof for the people had a mind to work. Notice before the work ever became in action, it was something that was processed in the mind. You have to consider the work that is before you before you will ever do the work that is at hand. Work in its definition is bodily or mental effort exerted to do something or make something purposeful by activity. It is labor. It is toil. Work by its very definition is not going to be easy. And all those out there that study to be muscle builders, they not only study to be a muscle builder, but they will not become one if they just watch the videos and read the books. Am I correct? They're going to have to start working and lifting those weights and doing those exercises. Amen. If you want to be somebody who is smart about the Word of God and knows how to answer every man the hope that lieth within you, it's not going to happen by sleeping on your Bible. Amen. Even if the Bible's open, you've got to get in the book and you've got to study it. I had a roommate in college that said, I'm, I'm in devotions. And what he meant when he said, I'm in devotions, was I'm sleeping on top of my Bible in the bed. He literally did that and would tell people he's going to go do devotions now. But as we look at this and have an understanding of it, we will not accomplish much by just thinking it or by being around it or by watching it. We have to get involved and we have to do the work. We have to put our hands to the labor. We have to put our feet to action. We have to get busy doing what God wants us to do. And Crossroads family, I want to commend you and say thank you for getting busy about the work of God and getting involved in reaching people outside these four walls in your own time. I want to thank all those who get involved and they pick up a broom or they push the vacuum cleaner. They get involved and they see there's a need. They want to help. They want to be a blessing. That's awesome. When people have a mind to work, it ticks the enemy off. But the enemy is going to talk smack and we also realize the builders asked for payback. But concerning work, there was no lack in their lives. Is there a lack here? Is there a lack here? Is there a hole somewhere that we need to see filled? Is there something that you want to do? Man, last week I had a young man come up to me who I've been dealing with and talking with. This young man suggesting, you know what? I, I, I want to get involved in the work of God to a greater extent and a greater degree. What is it that I can do? Listen, I love that. I love people coming up and saying, hey, what can I do? And I talked to him about some things. I said, listen, I would love to be able to train you in the Bible. So when somebody comes to me and says, I have this problem, we can have some introductory dealings with the pastor. But then I can say there's a man in our church that's really good in this area. And then I could give that man, this person, to be able to help with in the Word of God. That would be awesome. That would be exciting. That would be seeing the work of God expand and all of us working together because we have a mind to work to move forward. I recently gave someone a book called Life Quest by Carrie Schmidt out of Lancaster Baptist there in West Coast uh, Baptist College down there in California. Life Quest is a good book that deals with are you giving God your life? What are you living your life for? And this young man that I gave it to says I am not a reader but I haven't been able to put this book down. And he specifically made this comment. He says Justin I've been wasting my life and specifically I've been wasting my life in the area of video games. Now, I want to ask you a question. Are they wrong? No. But we can spend so much time that it literally eats up our life and we do nothing for the glory of God. And this young man said, man, I've been wasting my life away. It's about time that I start doing something for God. And that's just some of the things that God's doing through lives at Crossroads Baptist Church. But what influence are you having in your life with other people because you've got a mind to work? There's no lack in your life of work. You're busy. You're fervent. You're faithful. You're not slothful in the business of God. You're going on for His glory. You're like the people that was with Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah was one that obviously he probably put some hands to work and some feet to work at some time. But as the leader of that group, he'd walk around. He'd see the work that people were doing. He would say, okay, we need to strengthen this over here. 
We need this gate to be a little bit wider. We need to build it like this. We need to build it like that. He was the one on the job that oversaw it. But all these people didn't care that he may not be doing anything in their eyes. He was the one foreseeing what was going on. They had a mind to work. They would let nothing stop it. But it almost came to a place where their work ceased. Let's read about it. It says in verse number uh, 7, But it came to pass when Sambalat and Tobiah, here they are again, and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were very wroth. They're upset. Israel's coming back. They're reviving their city. And they conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah says, the strength of their bearers of burdens is decayed. There is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, they shall not know neither see till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times from all places when she shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places I even set the people after their families, both or with their swords, with their spears, and with their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. Fight for your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us. And God brought their counsel to naught that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his own city. You see, war was waged, but by the good hand of God that was upon them, the war had ceased. But that did not mean that their awareness of the enemy had ceased. They began working at the same time ready to war. Follow along with me as we continue on seeing this. Verse 16, And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work. The other half of them both held spears, shields, and bows, and habergens. And the root habergens are like the coat of mail that one would wear in a battle. Okay, so that's the habergens. And the rulers were behind all the houses of Judah. They which builded on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, every one had his sword girded by his side and so builded, and he, that sounded the trumpet was by me. So we see that these men, they would have a, a, a weapon in one hand or sheath on the side, and they would have the working tool in the other hand. They were ready to war as they built it. And thus the title of our series, Building and Battling. We could say it like this, point number four, when there's a threat, we've got your back. And so as we deal with our points, the enemy will talk smack. The builders ask God for payback. When it came to work, there was no lack. And then when there's a threat, we've got your back. And this has everything to do with how you handle your brother and sister of the Lord. We see in one hand that everyone was ready for battle while they worked. But Nehemiah is also setting people with spears and shields facing the enemy while the other people are behind them working on the wall, reviving the rubbish and causing the building to be rebuilt. Now as we paint the picture of rebuilding the, the, the rubble within the rubbish, we need to realize that this wall was torn down. Amongst the fire and the flames that had taken out the homes as well, this was a mess. The rubble is within the rubbish and they're trying to sort through through everything. And they're saying it's no way that we can sort through everything, rebuild at the same time, and fight as well. It's either we fight Nehemiah or we build. But if the enemy's coming, we're going to have to fight. And that's when Nehemiah had that great strategy of war. We're going to take some of you, put you on the wall to work, and the others of you put you with a spear and a sword or a shield or some type of weapon against the enemy so that if they come, they know we'll be ready for them. Listen, listen. We ought to have each other's back. We ought to be there one for another. 
When something happens, we don't completely dismiss them. We don't toss them to the side. We are to be there for each other. We're to lift up the head of the wounded warrior. We're to stand next to our loved ones and say, it's going to be okay. Though there's great trial and great turmoil in your life, and though it seems like the devil's just fighting and the flesh is welling up with inside of you, it is going to be okay. I want you to know I've been there and I've come through this valley. Everything's going to be all right. And with a sword in one hand and a work tool in the other hand, we continue moving on with our backs protected because our friends are for us. Have you ever been there before where you didn't know who your friends really were? You ever been in a place where it's just become so lonely? Right now in our preacher's pushes, we just started dealing with David. And as we go through daily in the Word of God and we're looking at David's life, we're going to realize that at one point everything's grand and great. David has slain his ten thousand, Saul his thousands. But then King Saul gets very jealous of his future son-in-law. He has him marry Michael because Michael's going to be a snare to him. I just know it. And so he sets up this relationship that now causes David to be his son-in-law. But then all the while, Saul just keeps getting angry with David and tries to take him out. And he throws those javelins at David, but David escapes him every time. And David behaves himself wisely. David behaves himself wisely. Three times in the Word of God, David behaved himself wisely when somebody was coming against him. But there came a day in his life where he left Jonathan. He left Michael, his spouse, that provided for him a way of escape. He left Samuel who prophesied for him and spiritually won a battle for him. He left his friends and he came all alone to the priest Ahimelech. All by himself with no one by him. And he had feelings of loneliness. The one that took out Goliath. The one who wrought great victories for Israel. The one who everybody praised is now the one who everybody's picking apart because King Saul's against him. You ever been there where you feel so lonely? Feels like there's no one who's on your side. It's called the Elijah syndrome if you read the Word of God. Where there's no other prophet doing what I'm doing. But God told him back, there's plenty doing the work. See, sometimes we feel like we're the only ones who are wrong in thinking that. Because there's so many more outside the little bubble of our world that's doing the work of God. And maybe the reason why we feel so alone is because we have allowed feelings to come into our life that God never intended us to have because God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God is not the author of confusion. If God's not the author of it, who is? And if we're allowing things into our life that may cause us to feel these feelings of loneliness, God said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Cast all your care upon me, for I care for you. And together we bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. There's all kinds of people walking around and they got these burdens on them. They've taken upon them the burden of bitterness and they're carrying it around. Then all of a sudden jealousy begins to sweep inside of their soul and they're carrying it around. And they've got bitterness and they've got jealousy. And everywhere they go, it's beginning to take notice in the minds of the people. They hang their head. They're not as cheerful as they used to be. And these are burdens that they carry. But can I tell you, what if one of us came alongside of them and took a load off of them? And said, you know what, I'm going to take the other one off of you. And I just want you to know that I am here for you. And I will help you. And I have your back. I've got the shield and I've got the spear. And I want you to know that I'm not going to let the enemy get you again. I'm going to be there for you. Because I am your friend. I want to take your burden. I want to bear it. And I so want to fulfill the law of Christ. And that's what I want to do as a pastor. I want to be able to say I am warring with you. Though we are building at crossroads, I want you to know that I want to hurt with you when you hurt. Sometimes the greatest way that the enemy likes to come into Crossroads Baptist Church and likes to tear us apart is in the area of lack of communication. If we do not communicate with one of each other, how are we going to know how the other one's feeling? And all of a sudden someone backs off and they're not there anymore when 
they left because of something that was said to them, but really it wasn't. It was just taken wrong, and the person that said that didn't mean to say it like this. And listen, it's going to be very hard for us to have each other's back if we don't communicate one with another. I got my sword, my spear. The enemy's coming, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let it be a surprise to you. See what I'm saying? We've got to be able to communicate with each other and move forward together. I've got your back. Crossroads Baptist Church, there may be times where I don't have the answer for you or your family. But I take that verse from the book of Psalms that says, When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I've stood before some people, like when I stood before the banisters, on that horrible day that they had to witness the funeral of their oldest son. And I had them all gather around there in the funeral home at Chillicothe. And I said, listen everyone, I, I know some of you, I don't know others of you, but I don't have the answers for everything. But I know who does. And so let me lead you to the rock that is higher than any of us. So what as a pastor I want to do is, I just want to ask you, will you let me have your heart? I'm just going to try to, to, to guide your heart towards the Word of God, towards who He is. And I just want to be a help. I want you to know that i got your back and I want to be able to pray for you when you have a need. I want to be able to give words of encouragement to you that may help in a situation. I want to be able to know what I can do to be a blessing to you and a help as you build and as you battle in your life. Listen, I understand that it's so much more than building and battling at Crossroads Baptist Church. It's building and battling our families first. If there's no success in the building and battling of a family's life, there will be no success in the building and battling of a church's life. And so we come to this realization in the Word of God. And we realize, number one, the enemy is going to talk smack. We see in the Scriptures that secondly, the builders, they ask God for payback. Lord, would you avenge? Would you revenge? Lord, would you do to them what they're trying to do to us? And concerning work, number three, there was no lack. Let's be busy about the work of God. Let's be those like the Tekelites in chapter 3 that said, you know what, we're going to go over here because there's work that's not done there. I know that somebody else lacked, but listen, I'm not going to worry about them. I just want to be faithful. I just want to serve. I just want to be busy about the Father's business. And that fourth thing, when there's a threat, let's have each other's backs. Let's be there one for another. Let's stand with sword and shield, spear and shield, our coat of mail on. We're ready to fight, but we're ready to build. There's work to do, Crossroads Baptist Church. Until Jesus comes back, there's work to do. Until God takes your life, there's work to do. Let's put away childish things because when we were children, we thought as a child, we acted as a child. But when we became adults, hopefully at some point, we put away childish things. And we said, dear God, what is most important to you? And let me glorify you. Let me live for you. What's the burden you have? What's your response? The vision that you have, does it cause you to arise and build for God? Are you doing something, every family doing something around the work of the wall that Nehemiah had? And then this... Rebuilding the rubble out of the rubbish. Taking those stones that someone else has destroyed and putting them back. And we just want to be able to take the bottle away from the alcoholic and build the wall of his life. We want to take the drugs of the hand of a druggie and make him to be free of those toxins that he's put into his body. We want to be able to take the bitterness that's stuck down there, it's been destroyed and destroying somebody, and we want to take it out of the rubble and rubbish, and we want to put that life back on the wall again. We want to be able to take a child's life who's so torn apart because of a decision mom and dad made, and pick it up and show them there is hope in Christ, and we're building this wall again. We want people to be able to see that there is life at Crossroads Baptist Church, and you'll find out that people are drawn to life. And Jesus Christ came to give life that we may have it more abundantly. Let's ask God to help us in some way in someone's life to rebuild the rubble out of the rubbish that we may be faithful to the work, the will, and the Word of God. Let's pray.